97.1. The fan. I'll answer questions for you. From the middle, Dave. Coach, after you reviewed the film, how do you feel like Dwayne Haskins played? I know he had the pick six, but overall, how do you feel like he played? Good. He's, uh, you know, he's a little bit. Uh, I don't want to say reckless with the ball, but he's still very aggressive. We don't want to take that away from him, but you know, play within the confines of plan to win. And uh, he did not on that one play, but, you know, it's typical. You want to get those guys in the game early in the season, you know, and let that happen and work through it, coach through it. And Mike Hill's been out the first four weeks with the suspension. Is it safe to say he's only going to miss two more weeks? I've just been saying one week at a time, so he won't play this week. Okay, but there's no, like, maximum that he could miss, like, Six games I'll tell you again next week. Okay. Still to be determined. Far right play. Do you remember the day or the practice or when somebody said to you, this C.J. Saunders kid can play, that he began to distinguish yeah. himself? Well, I don't remember the day. I just remember he's a very good player. He's just not big enough to play. You know, if he gets stronger and you can't. And but he I'm not playing. He's not playing when it counts. And he has the ability, too. You know, he's got – he's just not – and you know, we've had that happen here with Dontre. Fritt. You just can't. What do, what do you do with them? Say, oh, by the way, you don't have to really just fall down on this play because we are going to be a balanced team. But he's, you know, we're working on him because he's got the skill set. He's got the mindset. You know, he comes from a coach's family. He's a tough guy. Just got to get stronger. So he's lifting, eating, what, all of the above. Or all of the above. And how do you transform a guy like that? It just takes time. Takes time. And did you give uh, Chris Ash any advice when he left here regarding? You say it's going to be a tough road to hoe, or just? Well, I, I always I got myself in trouble the other day because I didn't mean it to become public when I said, you know, no disrespect, you know, just be very complimentary to the guys before you, go as hard as you can, and uh, you know, a job like that is a good job because you got a recruiting base, and it is a good job. Now you got to make it a good job, and they were. They're much better. That's the most improved defense that uh, I've seen in the country this year. I mean, from last year to this year, they're really. Um, they changed some things how they do business, and uh, I just got done watching four hours of them on film. And their defense, offense, I haven't watched them yet, but defensively, they're. They had Washington, I would think, held to ten points in the middle of the fourth quarter. Much improved on defense, and that's you can see Chris Ash's uh, fundamentals on it, and then also scheme. I asked you uh, after the game about the, the past defense, and specifically the past interference um, issues. When you watched it on tape, I know you're an offensive coach, but what is the, your philosophy in terms of how you teach that? Do you teach them to look for the ball? Is, are, are they doing something they should not be doing with the interference? Against? Yes, they are. I, and I think Shiano is a good one because I don't want to act like I'm expert at that. I have my opinions and we share them, and, you know, PIs are. That's one of the, you know, kickoff return, the front line of kickoff return, we have to turn and retreat and block people. The transition of pass rush from run to sacking a quarterback and bump and run coverage are the three hardest skill sets in my mind and that you teach. How do you react to the, you know, do you take your eyes off, find the ball? Do you, you know, they're just, so I, I think that's a great question for Coach Giano. You know, we, we have conversations about it, and when you get a PI, it's not, they didn't do it right. Could you give an injury update on, on Mike Weber, Chris Worley, uh, BB Weber's Landers? cleared, and he will play. Who is? Weber. Okay. Um, Joe uh, Burrows is cleared, but, you know, last week I wasn't going to put him in harm's way. That was not a – and, I, you know, Joe's such a tough guy. He thought he was ready after seven days. You know, it's a broken bone. So that's why he went in later. Uh, Worley's ready to go. I, I, I'm told he's going to be probable. Um, and BB Landers is probable. Uh, I will announce that the Malik Barrel hurt his knee. Yeah. So he's out. Out for the year. ACL. ACL. He has other knees. So it's just a tough of prayers with him and his face. He's such a good kid. So. Front row left, Bill. Urban, uh, two of the balls that JT threw for touchdowns, the, the jump ball to Victor and then the one in the corner to Terry, seemed like very well-placed kind of red zone throws. Um, where are you, I guess, in, in your evaluation of, of throwing the ball when you get into the red zone? Are you... You can see we're working out on it very hard. Uh, obviously, the game changes a lot down there, and we haven't been good the last couple of years, so we're working our tails off at that. And having a big guys like Austin Mack and, and Ben Victor, because a lot of those are two balls. Two balls mean it's you know, a little bit of arc on it because you have to throw it. No one moves, you know, because everybody's in within that confined area. So 
how comfortable am I? Uh, better than we have, but not where we need to be. I think it was 2013. You guys were best in the country at scoring touchdowns in the red zone. Was that just like you had Braxton, obviously, but just like Braxton creating stuff? Or like what, what were you doing then? Maybe Different was the tempo. That was Tom Herman was obviously very instrumental in that. We went, you know, I've always been the guy that you'd bring in two tights, and and this was simply go as fast as you can and uh, snap the ball. And you remember back then, and, and a lot of it was Braxton because he's so elite with the ball in his hand. All right, Austin. I mean, last year, there were so many conversations about the number of touches that maybe you wanted or could get to Curtis Samuel. Is it possible that Paris can get into that same category now? Sure. With what, he, what he's doing? Yeah, that conversation's already started. What's a good number? I feel like we asked that for Curtis. I mean, you have so many other guys to get involved, but what would you like to see now with what Paris? I'm not there yet with Paris. You know, he's kind of a, a I, you know, kickoff return, and do you put him on punt return? Do you? You know, he's dynamic. So, I, you know, we're always in that 10, 10 to 15 when you have elite guys that you want to touch the ball. Was that conversation really kick-started? If you looked at the Oklahoma game and you saw just three times for him, did that, did that stick out in your mind? Did you notice that at the time? I then? noticed it. Front row left, Doug. Urban, you talked about uh, Isaiah having his, a really good week last week. What, what's that do for an offense when you're right tackle, that that was an issue last year? If he's playing well and he's getting that right how much does that what does that do for your offense uh the, we are an offense life driven program we won our first uh season here we won we won 12 and 0 because of braxton Mill on the offense line and um pretty salty you know pretty good defense not a great defense but that's i think any coach would stand in front of you and say if your offense line becomes the best in the conference you're probably going to win the conference and last year we were not and we did not so that means that we should be in the hunt if we continue to grow as an offense line, and Isaiah is a big part of that. Are, are, what do you think of the direction overall, that group right Very now? Good. Very good. And I apologize if this question gets too long. Do you, when you come into a season, do you have a very good handle on what your team does well and where your team struggles? Or how often during a season are there things that surprise you that you thought, I thought we'd be good at this and we're not? Or always. I, it, it I does know exactly surprise. your question, and it always. And a lot of it's, you know, maturity and just, especially I think when you, in 2000 and uh, after we won it all, 15, you kind of had an idea. You know, the year after, I had no idea. They were all new players. This year, because once again, the, our friends leave early for the NFL draft, you're getting, you know, guys in the back end of our defense that you just don't know. And so they have to develop and grow. And I thought we'd be a little further ahead in pass defense. I thought our corner development would be a little bit further ahead, but they are making strides. Um, other than obviously the biggest game we played this year, I thought offensively we've made great strides throughout. But other than that game, far left, Mitch. After watching the film, what did you think of the defensive back play? I mean, was it were the penalties like worse than you thought, or not as bad as you well, thought? Well, typical, you know, defensive coach, defensive player, the palms up. It wasn't PI, and some of those were questionable. Uh, but I don't really look at much and other than I see a flag it was PI it's no different than uh, the one game we had a couple holdings I think that was a week before right by the receivers it's those conversations when I first got here a lot of those were well, I don't it wasn't holding okay, okay what was it then you know, or it wasn't P offensive pass interference so they were pass interferences they were wrong we got to get that fixed and move forward and it's technique related it's not effort related it's certainly not talent related it's technique related Second row left, Ari. Um, Urban, you guys, this might be a little bit off, <coughs> off the beaten path a little bit, but you guys uh, successfully recruited a very religious player, um, and he was saying that he was really thankful uh, for the opportunities that you guys have given him or the outlets that you guys have given him to continue his faith when he gets to college. Um, I was just wondering, when you're recruiting somebody who has, whose faith is very important to them, uh, how does that change the way you recruit them, and what uh, can you elaborate a little bit on maybe the programs or the outlets that you give somebody who wants to continue their faith when they get here? That's a very important part of my life, and I'm very proud to share that with our players. Uh, certainly there's no um, obligation or a mandate for any of that, but we certainly make it user-friendly around here. I don't want to get into too much detail, but it's very – because everybody's so busy. Our, our players, you look at their schedules, so we just want everything to be user-friendly, whether it be nutrition, whether it be um, 
real life Wednesdays, those type of things, and then also your spiritual life. So we have everything available to them. And we, I'm proud to say we have multi-religious uh, players, uh, you know, uh, denominational people in our program. And it's, the big R word is the key here, respect. Respect and make it available to them. Uh, in the past, you have had a pretty famous player, Tim uh, Tebow, who kind of became known for what he believes in. And I think part of his faith was to share with other people what he believes in, um, given the opportunity. Um, when you have a player who might feel the same way or is going to want to come to Ohio State and use the big platform that he has to try to spread the word, as he put it, how do you balance what, how far they can go with that sort of thing when you have a very diverse locker room? Wondering where you're going with this. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> well, I do. I do. Uh, I don't always share with you guys. Uh, I, mean, I think I think any time a player is going to throw his like when Tim Tebow gave that speech after Ole Miss, we lost in 08. And I remember I didn't hear it until I was driving home, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here's a young man that's going to put his heart on the floor. And we're in a society, and it, you know, really, it's always been that way. People are going to look at that and try to step on it. You know, I don't agree with that, but that's what people do. And so I just always warn. We have conversations. Obviously, we get very close with our players and say, just understand and. We had Josh Perry come in and speak to our team about just understand what you're doing, and uh, you're certainly entitled to do and say whatever you. That's why this you're not allowed to live in this great country. Just be cautious, aware of what the repercussions are. But I never say no. I mean, I think first of all, I think that's fantastic. If he can impact a, a young person the right way, I think it's awesome. Urban, just one quick, one quick. Uh, that was like a Tim move, but uh, what uh, is athletes in action? Uh, can you just give me a, a your viewpoint of what that is and, and kind it's of... It's a campus things. ministry that's uh, been very influential in my life, and it's, uh, you know, it's around the country. It's one of the largest that, and, um, um, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes are just campus ministries that make themselves available for players or student-athletes. Oh, down in Florida, I get very close and very involved. I support them. We have fundraisers at my house. I love the people involved, and I think they do a phenomenal job. Far left, Lori. Well, Jefferson's at Virginia Tech game. You stressed the importance of being ready for anything. I'm wondering if you <clears> ever <throat> get in a point in the season when you have enough film on your opponents where you feel comfortable enough to start drilling down more specifically on what you need to be ready for that week. We're getting to that point. Usually it's mid-season. And you always look at who they played before you. If they play overmatched opponents, you just kind of throw that film away. Um, other than personnel evaluation. But you're reaching that point now where, you know, you're starting to get the Big Ten Conference and everybody's playing a little more difficult preseason games. So, uh, you know, you start getting a five or six, you don't really look much back at the past. Or you start, you don't block ghosts. But early in the season, you, you spend a lot of wasted time because you're not sure what they're going to do, especially against us. Since you alluded to it earlier, do you mind me asking if you've spoken to Tom Herman since that article came out on CBS? Texas, Willie. Far left, Matt. Um, uh, and there was zero intent. That was not what that was uh, I, I typical. That's why I don't do interviews. <laughs> In case you're wondering. Um, rest of the season is Big Ten football. Uh, does, does it change things, feel different? What, what's different? Uh, yeah, I, I, it was interesting to see that in the locker room after the game, I said now it's time for conference play, and the players got excited, and that's why you go to work to try to get your ring. So, yeah. Uh, and also, the law of the beat bad, but with what happened, you have talked to us about talking to the team about social issues and with what happened with the NFL yesterday and the anthem and what the president said. It can be a divisive issue in a locker room. How do you, when something like that comes up and you say you talk to the team about social issues, how do you make sure it's not divisive? What's your message, I guess? To your team who come from all different places and have different feelings about it. It's been pretty consistent. It's been very consistent since we've been here, and it's the R word of the respect, you know, respect all. And uh, I personally have very strong beliefs and thoughts about things like that. Uh, and I share them with my friends and obviously very close with my family about our thoughts. I have with uh, some of our players, we have not, I didn't even realize it all happened until today because we're so busy on a Sunday. Uh, but, you know, I, I visit with a few players, and I always listen to the pulse of the team. And I have, you know, Ryan Stampers of the world that are part of my staff, and I just listen. 
And if it needs to be addressed, I will. I haven't made that decision yet because I, I had no idea anything happened until today. But everything I'm hearing from our players, it's we're playing Rutgers and go as hard as you can. And final two questions. Back row, Jared. Uh, hey, Urban, about uh, this is another example where you're, you're playing against a team coached by a former assistant. And I just wonder, when you have an assistant here working for you, whether it's been here or Florida or anywhere else, is there something unique in that person that you can identify and say that sure. person's going to be a head coach? Can you explain what, what the dynamic is that that person has? Sure. I think big picture. I think, uh, you know, if he, if he lives in a little tunnel world, sometimes those are your best assistant coaches, but they're not meant to be a head coach if they're big picture people. And uh, I think especially in college, the recruiting aspect, they, have to, they can't be good. They have to be our, your best recruiter on your staff or they're going to fail. And uh, uh, so big picture and a great recruiter. And then uh, there's other things, but those are the two. I mean, and I can, usually can tell right away. When Chris Ash was here, for example, what, what was it you saw in him when you hired him and then when he was ready to leave that made you think that guy, he's got it? The two things I mentioned. Exactly. And yeah, I knew Chris uh, was going to be, you know, he's one of the best we've had and did, obviously did a great job. Well, we went from well, most missed tackles in college football are the fewest. And I was 14 his first year. Yeah. So he did okay. Uh, I give him a good solid A minus. No. <laughs> No, he, he was an impact coach for us, and you could tell right away. I think Chris is a great coach. And final set of questions from Earl Reich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Urban, is, is there such thing as a kicker? I mean, uh, do you pay attention to, like, literally the thump of the ball when a guy's foot's hitting it, and do you hear that now with Sean Nurnberger again? I mean, yeah. what, what is different about him compared to, like, a couple of years ago? Well, maturity and in shape, a grown man. He was a little boy when he first got here and acted like a little boy and didn't prepare like a – grown man so he's a grown man now he's actually coaching our freshman kickoff guy who did much better Saturday other than the one mm -hmm. so I, I just I, I really you know I think his family and obviously this program has done wonders for him because he's a grown man he's really handled he's and he's hitting it now that, that's in practice he had a 57 yarder the other day and he's hitting it uh, do you get the sense Paris Campbell is close to a kickoff return I mean to the house seven yards or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it, it, poor Coach Combs. What is he showing you, though, when you watch the video? What is he? What 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 is coming across? Obviously, he's getting dynamic. The too. Yeah, and, and it's if you're uh, done that special teams forever. If you get a, a real guy back there, you block harder. Yeah. If it's just human nature, if you if you get a guy that can't do it, then why am I doing this? Because there's not one player in this program that came here to be a right guard on kickoff return. But we the culture of the program and then knowing that cat's back there, you better block hard because this might come out. I think he's leading the country right now. Uh, last thing, C.J. Saunders, I mean, we've been hearing about him getting open, making plays and practice, all this kind of stuff. Is there such a thing as a guy having a knack sure. for getting open? And number two, do some, can some of your receivers take some learning points, I guess? They have. They he, have. He's yeah. very well respected on this team. K.J. Hill has that. K.J. is a guy that can understand spacing of, of the defense and you know, maybe not the fastest guy in the world, but he usually gets open. And CJ, I, mean, I hope, I think he's got two years left after this. He has the ability to play here if he gets stronger. Do you have a target weight for him? I mean, what, 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 what is the? Big. Yeah, big. Bigger. <laughs> Bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, Coach. One last. Steve, in coach, the back row middle. Something just came out about uh, another Big Ten head coach just made a comment that it is a league wide problem about standard of care for the visiting team going in at these other home venues says that their reception was not good and that the locker room here was, no no, oh. no not Ohio State that it's a league-wide problem you've been all around the league at this point I mean, have is. you encountered many difficulties either the reception you've had the cleanliness of the locker room couple but do you do you view it as an issue that the commissioner should yes take up and, and I've shared that with our athletic board? director and the commissioner should handle that that's not this is not all due respect this is a Big Ten conference so yeah should the days of the days of treating your yeah I, I, that's should happened. Be the best of the best. Absolutely, and that's the commissioner. In my very strong opinion, that should not be allowed. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Coach. Your number one source for sports, ninety-seven point one. The fan. fan.